You're listening to the Conversations with Kids Peace podcast. Advice, information, and inspiration from experts at the leading provider of mental and behavioral health services for children, adults, and those who love them. Now, here's your host. The Conversations with Kids Peace podcast is sponsored by Spyglass Solutions, a nationally recognized management consulting group with comprehensive experience in the challenges of the healthcare field. Learn more at spyglasssolutions.org slash conversations. Hello and welcome to our podcast series, Conversations with Kids Peace. I'm Bob Martin. The latest issue of Healing Magazine from Kids Peace has just been published at healingmagazine.org. And the spotlight section in this issue looks at how games and game playing can be beneficial in the therapeutic space. And one of the featured articles involves the famous role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons and Individuals with Autism. The article's author, Rob Harvey, joined us last fall on the podcast to discuss his work in this area, and we're delighted to bring you that episode again. Enjoy. Millions of years ago, when T-Rex roamed the Earth, It was the 1970s and I was in high school. And there I found out about a pastime that was unlike anything I'd ever heard of before. It was a role-playing game in which players took on characters who took on personalities and powers as a result of the roll of dice. And it apparently went on and on and on, days, weeks, sometimes months at a time. Devotees of the game would talk in shorthand. Hit points, critical hits, rules as written, 20-sided die, dwarves, elves, wizards, clerics, attributes, etc. All of which made it abundantly clear that this was its own community. And the game, of course, was Dungeons and Dragons. Fast forward 40 years or so, avoiding T-Rex in the process, and D&D, as it's known, is still around. In fact, it's gaining a little bit of a cool vibe with avid gamers returning to it as the original RPG experience, including a growing list of celebrities like Stephen Colbert, Patton Oswalt, even the ultra-cool Vin Diesel. But recently, we learned of something even more unexpected than the Fast and Furious D&D. Dungeons & Dragons as a therapeutic tool for group sessions with individuals with autism. To tell us about how he's adapted a game he enjoys to address the needs of the kids he sees at Kids Peace, we welcome back to the podcast our good friend, Rob Harvey. Rob is the director of IBHS, that's Intensive Behavioral Health Services, at Kids Peace's Community Programs in Pennsylvania. Rob, welcome back. It is always good to talk with you, even in a socially distant conversation. Always a pleasure to be here, Bob. Excellent, excellent. So, for those who are not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, um, can you kind of quickly explain the game, or describe the game, I should say, and how it's played? Sure. Um, Quickly will be difficult, but I will do my best. Uh, So Dungeons and Dragons, um, as you said, you know, came about uh, before I was born, uh, but then I I played it with my brothers. um, And it's it's a game where, uh, you know, I suppose the closest thing to it is a, it's a board game, I guess. Uh, but there's no set board. There's no set pieces. The the adventure is coming out of the the mind and imagination of of one player who's called the the dungeon master or the game master, depending on what version you're playing. Um, and this this person puts forth a a set of challenges that the the group then has to overcome collaboratively. Uh, So, like you said, each person chooses their own character, um, and typically it's something very fantasy-based, you know, an elf fighter, a, 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 you know, a dwarf cleric, you know, something like that where, you know, it's it's very easy to kind of get lost in the kind of fantasy world and get away from that, uh, you know, that kind of day-to-day. And largely, um, you know, the, the game is determined by dice rolling. So there are, you know, there's the standard six-sided dice that we're all very accustomed to, but there are 12-sided dice, there are 10-sided dice, there is the the very important 20-sided dice, which is really what Dungeons and Dragons is built around. And so, you know, there's, it's a combination of luck and also your 
uh, you know, the things that you come up with to, to do as your character in order to, you know, overcome those challenges. And one game can last years, you know? Uh, so it's, it's, it's funny when you tell people that and then all of a sudden they're like, um, uh, well, I, I need to see the rule book. And you're kind of like, yeah, you know, it's the, it, you know, the dungeon master is going to tell you what to do. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there is a rule book, but that tells you kind of, it gives you kind of a general set of, uh, you know, uh, just kind of principles to go by, but the story is all, all in, in the head of the person running the game. That's wild. So tell me how you came up with the idea of using this in your group therapy sessions. Sure. So, um, so this isn't uh, something that I made up. It's, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games have been used in therapy for a long time. Um, so I kind of heard of it, but really where I landed on it was uh, for years, I've, I've been running uh, theater groups for individuals with autism. Um, and and it just, they're just so successful. The, the individuals that are in them, uh, and I've had kids as young as I think seven or eight probably is the youngest in those groups up to, you know, individuals in their 30s and 40s in these at this point. Um, and the way that I've always run these is that each person chooses their character that they're going to play in that, that theater production. Uh, and then I write a script and they, they practice it. And then, you know, we have rehearsals and then they enact this play, uh, typically in, in person, but most recently we actually did one on Zoom. Um, and these theater groups are so, so amazing. I, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen these individuals do so wonderful with them, but in my head the whole time I'm thinking, this is perfect, but we need, I need to do something that's improv based. Like, you know, real life is not scripted. Uh, real life is constantly changing and adapting and, you know, as much as we sometimes wish that we knew what our line was, you know, like line, please. What I want to say. Um, and and then that's part of the whole looking for the rule book. You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, who wouldn't like a, a rule book on life? Um, so, but you know, improv is really more like real life, but it's so uncomfortable. Nobody, nobody would sign up for an improv group. Uh, except for maybe Steve from the office or, you know, <laughs> characters like that. I mean, some people do it, but it's, it's terribly uh, scary, you know, improv. And I, I just kept thinking like, this is really the next step for these groups, but I can't, I can't hit on it. And then it came to me, the game that I'd been playing since I was about seven years old um, is improvisational theater. That is what the game is. And so, you know, I, I, I spoke to my team at the time and I said, you know, do we think this is something we could try? Do we think this might work? And they said, well, you know, sure, let, let's, let's give it a shot. And, um, you know, so that's, that was kind of how it, it, it happened. Um, and it was just, it just kind of all fell together and it, it's, it's just been perfect since. Were there particular goals you had when you when you uh, decided to try this for the group uh, to come out of the game? Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, um, so you know the the kind of big skills that we're looking at when so to to kind of look at the the population that I'm working with. Um, I've worked with individuals with autism of all all different abilities. Uh, you know. So some that have very limited uh, language, some who have lots and lots of language, but are more inhibited in their, in their ability to, uh, you know, have complex relationships and things like that. So, you know, this, this intervention was really targeted at individuals who are kind of uh, further along in their journey um, and, and need those kind of higher, higher, uh, you know, higher level social skills, you know, soft skills, people refer to them as, I guess, sometimes. Um, but uh, that ability to really connect to others really, you know, kind of strongly. So the things we look at in order to develop those relationships are things like really strong perspective taking skills, uh, really strong flexibility, 
really strong social uh, problem solving. Um, the, the negotiation of, you know, complex social interactions, right? So these are, these are skills that are very difficult to duplicate in a, in a group setting where you're sitting around talking about, you know, what you're going to do this weekend. So, you know, there's all different formats of social skills groups. Uh, and, and that's where the, the theater piece came in, where they were kind of enacting taking on other perspectives, interacting with other characters, learning about different things. And then that improv piece was to, to kind of bump that up and, and, and put them in these situations. So the, the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons was that you're by default, you are playing a different person. You are not yourself, uh, which has, which has, you know, two beautiful things to it. One that, you know, they are right off the bat taking on a different perspective, which is, what, what we want to see. But then two, they're uh, removing themselves from the, the shame of, of making a mistake as themselves. So if they screw up this social situation, it's not, it's not Rob that just got rejected or Rob that just fell down and everybody's laughing about. It. It's my character. So, you know, there's a lot of research into this kind of uh, therapeutic role play where you are you know, the, you're still facing some, you know, consequences of your actions, but in a removed sense. So I, I really wanted to capture on that. That was a big one. The perspective taking, the, 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 you know, the kind of, the, the, the consequence kind of, 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 of different social interactions, but also the, the taking, the taking risks and, um, you know, seeing them pay off or seeing them fail, but, you know, then trying again. Uh, and then, you know, the, the collaborative piece, there, there are few board games. I know that there, there are a lot of people out there who are avid board gamers who would scoff at what I'm about to say, but there are few popular uh, board games where you are working together. It's usually, you know, the monopoly of six hours later, one person arises as the victor. This is a, a game where the whole table if they're, they're either going to win together or they're going to lose together. Right. You know? So I wanted to incorporate that kind of team, you know, kind of aspect, which is social in and of itself. Um, and then, you know, just, uh, just the, the fact that it is so reinforcing, so fun, you know, I, I, I don't think that, you could you could ever you know place enough value on on how important it is for for people to enjoy their therapy uh, because that's what keeps them coming back and I I can tell you that <laughs> just that by itself I have I have you know people do not miss this group like this right. most of the groups I run are like oh we run eight weeks and then we take a break for a, a month or so. They, they will not, that will not stand with, with, these, <laughs> you know, they, they are there every week, come hell or high water. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, that was capturing that motivation was, was key so that they are really motivated to engage in this, you know, this amazing group therapy experience. I'm wondering if you can give me an example of um, an adjustment that you had to make in order or in the game in order to bring it to your group oh yeah that's a great question um so so there's a, a couple things come to mind uh the first one is that in the the current edition of dungeons and dragons so i'll spare you the the full history but we are currently on fifth edition so you know there was you know original and now we're on fifth edition many years later so in fifth edition they added this thing called inspiration points. And basically an inspiration point is something that is granted to a player for doing something cool, heroic, funny, whatever. And that allows them a re-roll. So on something where they, they wanna do something and they roll poorly, the, the dungeon master can grant them this, this, you know, um, this re-roll, this inspiration point. So, uh, so I've kind of, I've kind of adopted that, I've, you know, gone overboard with that because anytime I see them, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a kid who normally shies away from a social experience and they're like, 
oh, let me try this. I'm like, you know what? That's awesome. Here's an inspiration point. You know, if, if it's a kid who normally doesn't work together with another person and they make even the smallest effort to help that other person, hey, take an inspiration point. Um, I've even been known to give out inspiration points uh, in other groups to use in Dungeons and Dragons group. I'm like, hey, what you just did there, right? I'm like, hey, what you just did there, that was really cool. Take an inspiration point for next Monday, right? So, um, and, you know, it's almost like a little secret joke between the two of us, but, you know, so it's, it's, it's this really cool, like, token um, that has some in-game purpose, but also has this group kind of reinforcement ability to it where everybody sees it happen and they're like, oh, that's something that I should do more, you know? So it's got this cool shaping ability to it. Conversations with Kids Peace is sponsored by Spyglass Solutions at spyglasssolutions.org slash conversations. Spyglass offers evidence-based consulting services to help your healthcare organization become more efficient while delivering more positive outcomes for your stakeholders. Spyglass consultants bring hundreds of years of collective experience to bear on the questions you need answered in today's healthcare environment. To find out how they can help you, visit them at spyglasssolutions.org slash conversations. That's spyglasssolutions.org slash conversations. I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of folks would just say, hey, you know, um, we're going to do this. And they'd go, you're going to do what? With what? With who? What? And so I'm just, I, I, how did that go? Like, how, did, how did the pilot work out for you? So, um, yeah, the, the pilot was, it, it was amazing, you know, but the actual getting it started, there was a lot of convincing that had to take place. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't hard to convince my, my supervisor at the time. She was all on board. Um, so that wasn't difficult at all. Uh, but get, getting the families to understand what exactly it was that I was inviting them to take part in uh, was difficult because, you know, I even remember I was like, I have to put on the sign up form like this is not a cult. There is no, you know, there, because there's been this strange association lasting from the 70s and 80s. Yes, I was going to say that's one of the things I, I that did come to mind when we were talking about it. And I did go back and take a look and there was um, a lot of, uh, you know, frankly, just nonsense thrown around about it. Yep. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting that 40 years later, you have to go back and say, by the way, you may have heard this, you may remember this, it's not true. It wasn't it's true then, true. and it's not true now. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, honestly, I think I was more worried about it than I should have been because, you know, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, running social skills groups of various kinds for I, I can never quite figure out how long it's been, but over 12 years. So the parents, they trust me. They're like, well, this sounds different, but you know, it's Mr. Rob. So, you know, let's give it a try. Uh, so it started out, the pilot was a handful of, of teenagers. I, I think there were, you know, five or six um, by the end of that summer, the going into that fall, we were up to, over 10. There was a time, Bob, and I don't know how familiar you are with the game, but people say like, oh, never more than like six people at my table. Um, you know, six, seven, eight, that's a really big group. At one point, we had 14. Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, it was it was slightly un unmanageable, but it, but it worked out. And then, uh, so because we got so big, then we, we kind of split the group um, and then kind of split the group again. So, you know, COVID aside, because it's kind of thrown a, a wrench in things, but at one point we had just at, just at the Bethlehem site, we were running four groups a week. Um, so, you know, it, it just became this thing that, that so many people wanted to take part in and they were, they were hooked. It, I, you know, I've done you know, various kinds of interventions in my time. Um, and never have I seen until Dungeons and Dragons group, kids acting differently at the end of the that group than they were at the beginning of the group. You know, not like, uh, you know, not like complete turnaround, but like actually like engaging in, in different behaviors just based on that day. So from week to week, 
from month to month. Uh, and they loved it. And, you know, you ask, I would ask the, the, the individuals in group before, you know, no, none of them had ever played. I think maybe out of, you know, the, the, you know, 30, 40 plus individuals that have been through these groups, um, maybe three or four of them had played before. Um, but if you, if you pull them, which I have done after that, say, like, what's your favorite thing to do? What do you like to do with friends? What's your favorite thing? Dungeons and Dragons. You know, so despite the fact they had no idea what it was before, it, it quickly became like this, this just amazing thing to them, which was just so, so uh, joyful for me because it has been such a, you know, a point of joy in my life. So to, to be able to help them with their goals and to, you know, build their skills, but also enjoy it was just, you know, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah. I think when we had one of our conversations, you mentioned that about the, um, the extraordinary evidence of progress that you saw. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, do you think that um, games like Dungeons and Dragons, similar role-playing games, would they have a role do you see maybe in other ways in the therapeutic space beyond oh, what you've been using for? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've been, I've done some consultations in our hospital uh, and I've, you know, helped out at our acute partial. I've seen various, you know, levels of care in, in our programming at kids piece. Um, and, and, and I, I look at just the, you know, the need for connection as a group that, that Dungeons and Dragons could really bring to them, you know, to find joy together, to solve problems together, um, to, you know, to have a, a shared space that doesn't feel like um, just therapy, which can be draining, which is, can be stigmatizing, unfortunately, which can be any number of things like this, you know, they, they feel like they're just there playing a game. And to an outside observer, that's what it looks like. But they're, they're building this, this connection as a table. There's something about the, the table in Dungeons and Dragons um, that builds bonds that, uh, that are um, unbreakable. And, you know, you asked about, about uh, modifications. And, you know, even in the youngest group that, that I've run, we're not even – we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, but the rules are just completely different. It's, it's, you know, because I'm simplifying it. There's so much math in Dungeons. Right. And right. <laughs> so, so it kind of pull out that element and, you know, just use one type of dice and really it's like, you're good at this or you're not good at this. So if you're good at it, you know, you have to roll, you don't have to roll so great. You, they actually roll two dice instead of one and they take the higher. Um, that is borrowed from Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so there's ways you can adapt this, you know, kind of intervention to, to any group of people. And it has no age limit. I've, I've done it with my children when they were as young as five. I've, you know, played it with my father who is 75. So, you know, it's, it's this amazing universal thing that if you can get a person to agree to sit down at the table, they will almost always enjoy it. Um, which, you know, I, I'm not going to guarantee it. There, there are a handful of people I've seen who are like, ah, this just isn't for me. Or some people are just like, well, you know, I'm interested to watch, you know, I don't really mm -hmm. play. Usually those people come around eventually. I, I, it seemed to me that that'd be something that you'd find a lot of people going, let me just see what's going on here and everything. And then yeah. 10 minutes into it, they want to be a part of it. It's, it's almost, yeah. you, as you were speaking there, I was thinking, it's almost like a laboratory session to take the things that they've that they've they've been taught or they've been told about and, yep. and give them a ride without them realizing that they're actually doing that it's, yes they're just playing the game 100 percent. and you know and i take you know we know we know these individuals really well so a lot of them have individual therapy with um Ashley Huber is the person who kind of co-runs most of these groups with me. And uh, she works with a lot of these individuals one-on-one -on -one outside of the group. So she can, you know, kind of relay to me um, some things that are going on. And I'm like, okay, I can work that into the game and they'll never know, you know? So things like, even like flirting, like flirting is terrifying in real life, but in the game, it's kind of funny, but you can kind of 
try it out and see what your voice sounds like when you're, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're flirting with somebody, you know, and the repercussions are, are very, you know, small. Like what's the worst thing that can happen? We all laugh together at the funny thing that happened. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's super cool. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. One thing before I, before we, uh, wind up here. I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about, you had told me there was a phenomenon of, let's just say the game migrating out of the group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. what happened there? So, um, there, there is an, a number of players who, who once a week just wasn't enough. And so they created their own groups. They went to local comic book stores. So there's, you know, in, uh, so as a board certified behavior analyst, you know, practicing applied behavior analysis, um, you know, we're always looking for, you know, skill building, but then generalization of those skills, right? So they're not just doing it in group, they're doing it in the real world. And what better way to show that than them starting their own groups and, you know, just playing out, you know, at, at school clubs, at, at comic book stores, with their families, with their friends, running games on Discord. Um, it, it just became this, it just ballooned. And, you know, it's just amazing how, how social they, they can be in, in, in the right circumstance. And, yeah, it's just fantastic. I there's one. Can I tell a quick story? Sure, absolutely. Great. Um, so th this one young man that I that I worked with in in particular uh, after the group had been going on for some time, and he loved it, and and you know was having so much fun. Uh, before group, the one day um, I was standing in the lobby, kind of getting getting things around, getting getting ready. Um, and this, this young man's father approached me and he said, you know, this is kind of hard for me to say, but I really need you to know that, you know, my, my son is a, a teenager and, you know, throughout his life, we've never had anything that we connected over. We've never seen eye to eye. We've never had a, a shared point he said, but I played Dungeons and Dragons and now we play Dungeons and Dragons together. And this group gave us that, you know, so that was a, an unintended, like I had, you know, who knew, like I didn't even, you know, I wasn't even really a party to, to their, their kind of relationship. Um, and it was, it was just so powerful, you know, but that, that reach that just goes beyond the table starts at the table, but so quickly goes throughout their whole life. That is fantastic. Wow. That, what, what an, what an inspiration point. You get yeah. that. You get an extra role next time, Rob. Well, well done, Bob. Speaking of that, you know that we end all of our conversations with asking for a life hack. Today, we're going to do something special. I want you to give us your favorite dungeon master life hack. All right, all right. That's that's good. I like that. <laughs> uh, so so here's here's my life hack. As a dungeon master, um, players are 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 so visual. Right, so some people use miniatures to represent. I've I will not divulge how much money I've spent on miniature <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons people, um, but uh, but one of the greatest things that I've found is is Pinterest to use as a dungeon master. And Pinterest is kind of commonly associated with um, you know art projects, art projects or hobbies, yeah, recipes, things like that. Well, you know, it really is just a, a way to organize graphic material. And so, you know, there are a, 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 a zillion different pictures of, of, you know, orcs and elves and wizards and castles and anything you could possibly imagine. So I have this, this just ridiculously huge... Uh, Pinterest board of quest ideas, of character ideas, of settings, of, you know, you know, anything. So, you know, there's memes on there and things too, and, you know, really anything, but that, that would be, if, if you're wondering like, oh, you know, I, I just have so many ideas, but I don't know how to organize them. Make yourself a Pinterest board and you can make subgroups. And then when I think, when someone says like, oh, who's, 
you know, there's somebody sitting in this tavern here. Who is it? I'm like, oh, I didn't think of somebody for this. I just pull up a Pinterest board and I'm like, oh, it's this guy. And show them the picture. And it, it always makes it better when, when you've got a picture. You know, they yeah, it's good to have a picture in their head, but there's a lot of that in the game. So anytime you can incorporate, like, this is what the bad guy looks like. Whoa, right? So that's that would be my life hack is is make yourself a nice Pinterest. You know, we're taking role playing games, applying it to therapy. Now we take Pinterest, apply it to D and D. We are all about the connections right here. Yes, absolutely. Rob Harvey is director of intensive behavioral health services for Kids Peace Community Programs in Pennsylvania. Rob, I rolled my twenty sided die, and it came out that you are a, a dead on skill monkey at being on our uh, podcast, and you can come back anytime. I love it. Rob Harvey's article on D&D and autism can be found at healingmagazine.org, along with other game-themed stories, perspectives on life after the pandemic from a therapist and a teacher, and how technology use in mental health care will be changed forever by COVID-19, and much more. Again, please visit healingmagazine.org to see the latest issue and its articles. The Conversations with Kids Peace podcast is produced by Robbie Allred. I'm Bob Martin. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to having you join us again for more Conversations with Kids Peace. Until then, take care.